This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning. Thank you everyone for being here. As you can see this morning, our speaker is Tina Varghese. Tina is a first year fellow in our clinical track and um, she, uh, we've kept her away from Emory Hospital so far this year on purpose, but she got here to give a talk despite our attempts. Um, Tina is a native New Jerseyan, uh, went to the College of New Jersey for undergrad, went to Rutgers for medical school, came here for residency. Uh, so many of you may know her from her residency where she was an excellent resident uh, and we're excited she's a part of our fellowship as a first year fellow. As you can see, it looks like we're gonna talk about endocarditis, Tina. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Good morning, everyone. I'm gonna be speaking today about some contemporary challenges in the prevention and intervention in infective endocarditis. These are my objectives. We're gonna do a quick overview of the manifestations and complications of endocarditis, discuss some of the guidelines and issues regarding prophylaxis in endocarditis, discuss which patients with endocarditis should be referred for surgery and what the optimal timing for surgery would be, and talk briefly about some unique populations um, such as prosthetic valve and TAVR patients and patients with cardiac devices and how we manage those with endocarditis. We'll start with a case. This is an 80-year-old male who presented to an urgent care center complaining of three weeks of ankle swelling and pruritic rash. His past medical history was notable for hypertension and a leaky valve that he said he followed an outside cardiologist for. His review of systems was otherwise negative, no fevers, chest pain, shortness of breath, orthopnea, or syncope. He was a former smoker, and he's otherwise independent with his ADLs. He walks several miles a day without any issues. He's on very little medication, mainly for blood pressure. He does report um, requiring dental work, specifically tooth implants, about eight months prior to presentation without any complication and reports potentially receiving an antibiotic, which he said was clindamycin afterwards, and several weeks after that had a C. diff infection that required hospitalization. He was sent from the urgent care to the emergency room due to bradycardia. And this is his rash on the anterior shins and ankles that he presented with. His physical exam, his vitals uh, were notable for bradycardia to the 40s, otherwise afebrile, uh, normal to slightly high blood pressure. He was resting comfortably, and his cardiovascular exam was notable for a three out of six systolic murmur and a decrescendo diastolic murmur with some trace lower extremity edema and the rash shown before. His labs were notable for a creatinine of 1.5 with an unknown baseline, a BNP of about 1400, and a troponin of 0.31 that downtrended. This is his EKG. The arrows trace out his P waves, um, and he's in complete heart block with a narrow junctional escape rhythm. So we decided to admit him, um, given this complete heart block that he was not aware that he had had a history of, um, thought maybe he had some conduction disease that could be causing this abnormality, thought we'd watch him on telemetry overnight and just get an echo. So this is his transthoracic echocardiogram. Here we have a three chamber view of the heart. This is his left atrium, left ventricle, mitral valve, and then aortic valve. Um, what we can see here with the Doppler is that he has an eccentric aortic regurgitation. Um, diastolic flow reversal was seen in the uh, aortic arch and potentially in the abdominal aorta, um, and thus he was, um, this was labeled moderate to severe aortic regurgitation. <coughs> he has a little bit of mitral regurgitation as well. Given this finding, um, there was also a concern for a prolapse of one of the leaflets of the aortic valve. So given these findings, he underwent a transesophageal echocardiogram. So his TEE showed endocarditis involving multiple mobile vegetations on the right and non-coronary cusp of his aortic valve, a small abscess involving the right coronary cusp and annulus of the aortic valve, evidence of involvement of the annular fibrosa with severe AR, and severe thickening of the mitral anterior leaflet with a small aneurysm at the anterior leaflet. So this is his transesophageal echocardiogram. This is a mid-esophageal view, short axis of the aortic valve. This is his interatrial septum. This is his RA, LA. And what we can see here are multiple vegetations on the non-coronary and right coronary cusp of his aortic valve 
some bulging, possibly an aneurysm of this non-coronary cusp. And Doppler shows the aortic regurgitation that we mentioned before. This is an attempt at a long axis view of the aortic valve. And what we notice here is that this is his mitral valve. This is the anterior leaflet of his mitral valve. What we notice is that it's thickened, and there's this aneurysmal, potentially erosion type uh, finding at the anterior leaflet of his mitral valve. His blood culture subsequently grew back positive for granulocatella adiacens. This is a nutritionally variant streptococcus generally found in the oral cavity. And CT surgery was consulted for aortic valve and mitral valve replacement. So we'll do a brief overview of infective endocarditis. It's an infection of native or prosthetic heart valves, indwelling cardiac devices, or the endocardial surface of the heart. It's a rare disease. It affects about 10 out of 100,000 people annually, but it's associated with a high morbidity, mortality, and complication rate. So it's rare, but it's life-threatening. Majority of the cases are left-sided, and risk factors include being elderly, uh, having ESRD, which requires frequent sticks for hemodialysis and indwelling catheters, IV drug use, prosthetic valves, and prior endocarditis. Epidemiology, primarily we see this in patients with uh, a predisposition, uh, essentially structural heart disease, but anywhere from one third to one half of patients now with normal valves um, have endocarditis, and it's more common in urban communities. And what you can see in this graph is that from 2000 to 2011, the incidence of endocarditis has been steadily increasing. And we'll discuss uh, in 2007 the change in prophylaxis guidelines, um, but regardless, the slope of increase before and after the change in guidelines has been the same. Some of the terms that we use in endocarditis, there's right-sided endocarditis, which involves a <coughs> tricuspid and rarely the pulmonic valves. It's related to IV drug use and indwelling catheters. There's native and prosthetic valve endocarditis. And then there's a term culture-negative endocarditis, um, which can be due to a variety of reasons. It could be an issue with um, the lab or a suboptimal technique that fails to isolate the organism. Um, it could be a fastidious organism that has specific nutritional requirements to grow. Um, the culture or um, is just slow growing. Could be non-bacterial in etiology such as fungal endocarditis or potentially the patient received antibiotics prior to the culture resulting in culture negative. So the face of endocarditis has changed a lot in the last few decades which makes it hard to uh, keep up with the disease process. In the 1980s primarily we saw patients in the mid 40s presenting with endocarditis uh, ever since the 2000s, we see a lot more patients older than 70 present uh, with endocarditis. Rheumatic heart disease was the primary uh, feature of patients who presented with endocarditis, but now we see endocarditis in patients with congenital heart disease, degenerative valve disease, immunocompromised states such as cancer and transplant, and IV drug use. We still see native valve endocarditis, but now with the advent of prosthetic heart valves and devices, we're seeing endocarditis with them as well. Streptococcus was the uh, primary bacteria that caused endocarditis, and in certain areas still is, but it's, uh, Staphylococcus is starting to catch up due to frequent um, IV sticks and catheters that expose patients to Staphylococcus bacteremia. Before penicillin, we had minimal therapy to offer for endocarditis, but now we have improved imaging modalities, antibiotics, and surgery. However, due to the, the changing um, demographics and risk factor profile of endocarditis, the one-year mortality has remained the same of about 30%. Normal uh, valves are generally resistant to, bacteri uh, to bacteria adhesion and clot um, due to the endothelial layer that offers some protection. When endothelial damage occurs at the valve for whatever reason, the subendothelial matrix is exposed. Then when bacteria enters the bloodstream from GI, GU tract, iatrogenically, or devices, they have an easier time adhering to that subendothelial matrix, and they have help from platelet and fibrin uh, microthrombi um, and start colonizing in that area and maturing into vegetations, which can then embolize. Um, that area of growth also uh, recruits a lot of monocytes and inflammation, so you have an area of active inflammation and infection. Um, and certain bacteria, such as Staph aureus, have the ability to produce biofilms, which offer an added protection uh, for the organism against immune host response and antibiotics. 
This is a microbiology uh, breakdown of some of the typical organisms that cause endocarditis. So again, about 50% is caused by streptococcus. Streptococcus and enterococcus tend to cause more subacute presentation of endocarditis. Staph aureus is rapidly becoming more common, especially in developed countries. And then we have our HASIC organisms, which are more fastidious in growth. And then coag negative staph is about 5%. Part of the issue with endocarditis is that it can masquerade in many different forms, and so we have to have a high index of suspicion, um, as with our current patient that we discussed. Uh, the primary uh, presentation for endocarditis is fever, so patients may present with cold-like symptoms. They may present with acute heart failure, um, dermatological issues, a new valve disorder, stroke, rarely meningitis, but can be seen especially with strep pneumonia musculoskeletal pain, which could be underlying abscess, and dysrhythmia as our patient presented. This is the modified Duke's criteria that we use to diagnose endocarditis. Um, essentially, what it boils down to is that you need either two major criteria, so a strongly positive and suggestive blood culture with a strongly positive and suggestive echo, or all five minor criteria, which is fever, predisposition, as evidenced by IV drug use or abnormal valves, um, signs of immunological phenomenon, such as Osler nodes, which are painful nodes that you generally see at the fingertips, which if you biopsy shows a lot of perivasculitis, which is why we believe that it's an immunological phenomenon, or rod spots. Embolic events such as strokes, PEs, Janeway lesions, which generally present in the palms and soles of the feet and are painless, conjunctival hemorrhage, or suggestive microbiology. And so to be diagnosed with definitive endocarditis, you need two major or two or five minor or one major with three minor. And these are just some pictures to remind us what those findings look like. Something that we um, should look for, especially with aortic valve endocarditis, is periannular extension. Um, and so once the bacteria latch onto the valves, especially at the annulus, and create an abscess, that can create lots of problems for the patient. The weakest part of the annulus is the interatrial septum, and so the abscess tends to like to travel into that area, and that's where the AV node is located. And as a result, you can see different forms of heart block. Um, the pericardial layer, the pericardium layers around the proximal part of the aortic root and so if the abscess communicates with the pericardial layer, you can get perforation and subsequent per, uh, pericardial effusion, hemorrhagic pericardial effusion. Likewise, if it travels to the aortomitral curtain, you can have disease now that involves the mitral valve, so now you have a two-valve problem, both aortic and mitral. The abscess can communicate with any of the chambers and give the patient uh, a multitude of issues. If it communicates with the left atrium, it can result in pulmonary edema. Communicate with the left ventricle, you get paravalvular AR. And if you communicate with the RA or RV, you can get left to right shunt and present with heart failure. Um, things to look for on echo when you want to uh, assess for abscesses, essentially a thickening of the annulus, as you see in this picture here. Um, and you can see the abscess cavity filling with the regurgitant volume. So this is suggestive of an abscess involving the aortomitral continuity. And like I said before, that now implies a two-valve problem and has increased morbidity and mortality for the patient. Primary imaging modality that we use is echo. TTE is usually the initial imaging modality that we start with. And if a patient has low suspicion for endocarditis and you have good windows and negative findings, you can usually stop there. Um, however, if you have a high suspicion for endocarditis and you don't have the greatest windows or you have a negative TTE, a TEE then is recommended. Or if you have a positive TTE, um, but you want to lo uh, look for local abscesses or other complications like periannular extension, um, that's going to direct our management, especially with regards to surgery, um, then we should get a TEE. Prosthetic heart valves are another reason you should get a TEE, especially if the patient has a mechanical heart valve um, due to the acoustic shadowing that can occur on the transthoracic echo. Um, and staph bacteremia, just because of how virulent it is, should always get a TEE. Then you can get a TEE after you um, treat with antibiotics just to reassess vegetations and for clinical response. So now we're going to go into antibiotic prophylaxis. Um, so Thomas Horder was a British physician who first discovered that bacteremia could occur from oral flora. Subsequently, in the 1940s, we had multiple trials that showed that penicillin reduced the risk of bacteremia after dental extraction. And so in the 1950s, AHA released guidelines to recommend antibiotic prophylaxis. And some of the guidelines and updates after that recommended both oral and IM 
of prophylaxis um, for patients with both moderate and high risk of endocarditis and for procedures that included GI and GU um, procedures. That was essentially the standard of care for about 50 years until 2007 when AHA restricted antibiotic prophylaxis. The reason for restriction was because we had a lot of controversy uh, among our data and among the studies, and I'll just show a couple. So this is a population-based case control study that was conducted in 54 hospitals from 1988 to 1990. And what they looked for was association between different procedures um, and the risk of infective endocarditis. And they did not find any association between dental procedures um, and infectious endocarditis risk. If anything, what they saw was a mild association between daily flossing and reduced endocarditis risk. There was a Cochrane review that looked at all the um, randomized control trials, case control trials, and cohort studies uh, of patients who had increased cardiac risk, so cardiac disease, who underwent in fact, in fact, um, dental surgery, um, and looked at the incidence of infective endocarditis uh, after receiving prophylaxis. There were no randomized control trials to pick from, so ultimately they evaluated one case control study that fit their inclusion criteria in the Netherlands and saw that in two years of um, evaluation, about 24 patients had infective endocarditis, had required prophylaxis, yet um, there was no uh, change in infective endocarditis uh, incidence. And so um, they concluded that there remains no evidence whether antibiotic prophylaxis is effective or ineffective against endocarditis. Um, what they did find in that study was that if prophylaxis was given at 100% compliance issue with 100% effectiveness, it would prevent maybe about five cases per year. And so then there was some concern that between the cost and the risk of antibiotic, whether the uh, benefit was actually negligible or, or beneficial. Um, so because of studies like that, uh, the AHA subsequently restricted prophylaxis guidelines uh, in 2007. Um, and so this was a study that was done um, to just see whether the incidence of viridan strep, which is one of the more common causes of endocarditis, changed after the restriction of prophylaxis. And what you'll essentially notice on this graph here is that the incidence has remained relatively the same. This grayed out zone is the 95% confidence interval. So despite restriction of prophylaxis in 2007 here, there was no significant increase in viridan strep incidence. A contrasting study, however, uh, was done in England after the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence released recommendations asking for complete cessation of antibiotic prophylaxis before dental procedures. So what you'll see in this graph here is that in March, which is this gray bar, that's when the recommendations had come out. And you can see a significant drop uh, in endocarditis prophylaxis from about 10,000 prescriptions per month to about 2,000, 3,000. But about three months later, there was a statistically significant increase in the incidence of endocarditis. And we don't have the microbiology behind this, so we don't know which bacteria um, or organisms cause the endocarditis, but we do see a jump. And we can't assume that there's causation here, but there appears to be some correlation between the restriction of antibiotics and the incidence, increased incidence of infective endocarditis. So we have a lot of conflicting data. We don't have many randomized control trials. We really just have a lot of observational studies and, and expert opinions. And so our concern is we're not sure if there's any significant um, bacteremia that's caused by dental procedures um, versus just daily toothbrushing. So you're talking about rare event such as dental procedures, but with high bacteremia burden versus your daily brushing teeth, which is a frequent event, but with low bacteremia burden, there's some conflict or con, um, controversy over which one is a higher risk for the patient. And we're also aware of antibiotic resistance um, is starting to gain some recognition. We're aware of anaphylaxis and allergic reactions that antibiotics can cause. And based on studies that we discussed, we're not sure if there is any true benefit to, antibi to antibiotic prophylaxis. And there's no randomized control trials looking at all this. So given all of these concerns, we now restrict antibiotic prophylaxis really to patients who are undergoing a more significant dental procedure, such as manipulation of gingival tissue or perforation of oral mucosa, and to those patients who seem like they would have, be at high risk for endocarditis um, with such procedures, such as patients with prosthetic heart valves, previous endocarditis, 
or congenital heart disease or transplant valvulopathy. So basically, consider prophylaxis for patients with previous endocarditis or high risk of developing endocarditis if they're going to undergo a significant dental procedure. But most importantly, something that we need to be aware of when we see patients in clinic and we're thinking about giving them endocarditis prophylaxis, we should strongly be recommending to them to practice daily good oral hygiene and keep up with their six-month dental visits. That will reduce the global or oral burden of bacteremia and limit spontaneous bacteremia that could result in endocarditis. Now we're going to talk a little bit about surgery and the optimal timing for such intervention. So the purpose of surgery in endocarditis is to remove infected material, restore cardiac and valve uh, function and integrity, and remove any threatening sources of embolism. About 50 to 60% of patients with endocarditis undergo surgery, and the six-month survival is over 80%. But the 10-year survival is much lower at about 40 to 60%. We're not really sure why there's such a huge drop after 10 years. We think it may have something to do with prosthetic valve complications or potentially persistence of biofilm complexes um, that, that result in lower survival after 10 years. Sometimes there is a resistance from our surgical colleagues to take patients with active endocarditis um, for surgery. And the reason they're concerned is you're working with inflamed tissue, infective tissue, and then um, the patient is undergoing surgical manipulation. And there's concern for high post-op mortality. Studies have shown there's up to 20% mortality for patients who undergo um, surgery in infective endocarditis when actively infected. And so sometimes then there is uh, an understandable concern about taking patients early. But again, most of this is based off of expert opinion um, and not randomized control trials. Uh, until 2012. This was a study that was published by Dr. Kang in uh, New England Journal of Medicine um, that <coughs> randomized patients to either early surgery or conventional surgery. Early surgery was defined as less than 48 hours after randomization, and these were patients with left-sided endocarditis, large vegetations at least 10 millimeters or greater, um, and severe AR or MR. The baseline characteristics of both arms were about the same. And the composite endpoint was death, embolism, infective endocarditis recurrence, and repeat hospitalization for heart failure. And what they found was that six weeks after a procedure, 3% of patients um, had the composite endpoint in the early surgery group, while 23% of patients had it in the conventional surgery group. So there was a statistically significant difference or reduction in the early surgery arm with regard to the composite endpoint. And when you look um, a year after randomization, there continues to be that statistically significant difference and reduction in the composite endpoint. We will say the endpoint was primarily driven by embolism, and so the ultimate conclusion was that especially with patients with uh, vegetation, high risk of embolism, um, early surgery is, is preferred. And so um, based, on the, based on this study, uh, our guidelines have been updated to one, say that when it comes to surgical intervention, we should have a multidisciplinary team approach that involves cardiology, CT surgery, and ID discussing to see on an individual level what's best for the patient. However, if a patient presents with valve dysfunction and symptoms of heart failure, or if they present with endocarditis from a difficult bug like staph aureus or fungus or other highly resistant organisms, or if they have signs of uncontrolled infection as evidenced by abscess, heart block, persistent bacteremia despite appropriate antibiotics for five to seven days, then we should consider early surgery for these patients. So when we you know, get called to see patients with endocarditis and we're thinking about who we want to send for surgery, we should look for these criteria. While we have these guidelines, though, um, implementing them is easier said than done. Um, about 24% of patients who should technically undergo surgery based on those guidelines do not, and these are the main reasons why they don't. Stroke is about 23% of the reason why 23% um, of patients who don't undergo surgery um, is due to stroke. So we're going to talk about that next. So embolism in stroke is a major concern for patients with endocarditis. Embolism affects about 25 to 50% of the patients who present with endocarditis. The most common place where vegetations embolize is to the brain. Right-sided uh, vegetations generally go to the lungs to cause PE but they can get into the left side of the system via PFO. Risk factors for embolization include the first two to three weeks of antibiotics, um, which I think essentially just means before the antibiotics really get to 
get into the patient's system and, and stabilize and, and remove the infection, the first few weeks of presentation is when embolization concern would be highest. Vegetations with high risk features, such as large vegetations greater than 10 millimeters or hypermobile vegetations. Again, vegetations caused by uh, highly resistant organisms such as Staph aureus or fungus, or vegetations of the mitral valve. These tend to be, um, cause increased risk of embolization in patients. There's not a clear understanding of when we should take such patients, though, for surgery. We have the one study that we saw by Dr. Kang um, that recommends early surgery, but currently our guidelines say for patients with recurrent emboli and persistent vegetations, it's reasonable to consider surgery. Likewise, in patients with vegetations that have high risk features, such as hypermobility or uh, greater than 10 millimeters in length, again, early surgery may be considered in these patients. So what about major stroke in and of itself? The concern for major stroke in surgery is the fact that you take this person for surgery, you put them on cardiopulmonary bypass, or you start anticoagulation, and there could be hemorrhagic transformation. Or during the surgery, there's some perioperative hypotension, and then you get expansion of ischemia, which could be devastating for the patient. Up to 50% of patients with strokes um, undergo hemorrhagic transformation. And so this is another reason why, um, like we saw in one of our previous studies, some patients with stroke do not go for surgery. This was a study uh, published in 2013, though, that looked at patients who had ischemic stroke after endocarditis and either underwent early surgery or delayed surgery. In this study, early surgery was defined as within seven days um, of the stroke. And what they found was that in-hospital mortality and one-year mortality was not statistically significant between the two groups. And so they concluded from this paper that there doesn't seem to be a benefit to delaying surgery in patients with ischemic stroke. However, in the same year, a study that looked at patients with specifically hemorrhagic stroke found that if the patient underwent surgery within four weeks of um, their stroke, there was a 75% mortality rate. But if you waited after four weeks, there was a 40% mortality rate. Now, sample size is very small, as is with most of our cases, since this is a, a rare disease. But there is some trend to increase mortality the sooner you go for surgery and increased re-bleed, the sooner you go for surgery, specifically in patients with hemorrhagic stroke. And so with that, our guidelines currently say that if you have a patient who has an indication for surgery uh, with infective endocarditis and they had a stroke but no evidence of hemorrhage um, or extensive neurological damage, the risk of any post-op deterioration is low and you should take them for early surgery. However, if the patient has a major ischemic stroke and you're concerned about conversion to hemorrhagic stroke or they have intracranial hemorrhage, it's best to wait four weeks before you take them for surgery. So basically early surgery for quote unquote minor CVA and delayed surgery for major. Um, I'm not gonna dwell too much into this, um, but this is the uh, guidelines from STS with regards to what type of valve they like to use when they take patients for surgery. And in general, um, for aortic and prosthetic, for all aortic valve endocarditis and prosthetic mitral valve endocarditis, mechanical or biological replacement is preferred, but for mitral native valve endocarditis and tricuspid valve, repair is preferred if you can. Um, and a stented tissue valve is a bioprosthetic valve. Stented just means that um, the, the valve is mounted onto a stent, and there's some controversy over which, whether stented or stentless um, prosthetic valve gives better hemodynamics, but stented tissue valves apparently are easier to implant and have a reduced risk of uh, reoperation. And so when picking bioprosthetic valves, surgeons tend to pick stented valves. Uh, homographed valves are valves taken from cadavers. We don't really use them anymore in surgery with the exception of endocarditis. And so you can consider using homographed valves for patients um, who have IV drug use or just complicated endocarditis with, with abscess and annular extension because there is a concern that the patient may have to come back for repeat endocarditis in surgery and you may not want to put a mechanical valve in them. And finally, just um, discussing patients with prosthetic heart valves and devices. So prosthetic valve endocarditis affects about three to five, four patients, percent of patients within five years of surgery. It affects mechanical and bioprosthetic valves equally. 
you're more likely to see periannular complications with peri uh, with prosthetic valve endocarditis. So with native val valve endocarditis, about 40% of patients get periannular uh, extension and complications. With prosthetic valve endocarditis, a huge majority uh, experience periannular complications. And the reason for that is um, prosthetic valve endocarditis generally involves the annulus uh, with regards to endocarditis, so it's a lot easier to have periannular complications. While with native valve endocarditis, a lot of times the vegetation is seen at the leaflet tip, and so it's uh, it has to kind of travel over to the annulus in order to create periannular complications, and that's why we see more with the prosthetic valves. If the patient presents with endocarditis in less than one year post-op, um, the organism of cause is usually staph aureus, which has a high mortality rate, or coag negative staph. If it's after one year post-op, it's the same organisms as native valve endocarditis. Um, the Duke criteria is less applicable with prosthetic heart valves. Um, there's a lower sensitivity, and you're more likely to see negative imaging. And TEE is really important here with these patients. And it's not really clear right now what the optimal timing for surgery is for these patients. This is a video from ASC. Um, this is a long axis view of the aortic valve. And you can see the annulus here kind of bulging back and forth. And you can see a rocking motion of the prosthetic uh, aortic valve suggestive of dehiscence. So TAVR is um, a wonderful uh, option that has dramatically changed the outlook for patients with severe AS who could not previously undergo surgery or were too sick for surgery. However, endocarditis in TAVR is, uh, can be devastating. It affects about 1.1% uh, per patient year um, in terms of incidence, and the median presentation is about five months. Um, and we don't know yet whether transcatheter techniques can be successfully used for management, because these are patients who are too sick to undergo surgical uh, uh, aortic valve replacement. So now these are patients who need to under who now have endocarditis on top of all their comorbidities. And so it's, it's not certain whether it's safe to bring these patients back for surgery. So far, patients with endocarditis uh, and TAVR have both gone for open heart surgery and transcatheter valve and valve uh, repair and replacement. But we need to see uh, you know, what the results of that are, are in terms of long-term outcomes. Um, what you notice here is that patients with aortic valve um, endocarditis uh, with TAVR, in two years, the mortality uh, really uh, increases if you have aortic valve endocarditis with TAVR. So we really need to figure out kind of what the best method of approaching this is for our TAVR patients. With regards to pacemakers and ICDs, the microbiology is a little different since we're going through skin. There's a lot of coag negative staph um, and staph aureus that uh, are our primary etiology. And there's a high mortality if your device is kept in, but with complete device removal and antibiotic therapy, you can bring that mortality rate down to less than 20%. This is an algorithm um, proposed by um, some Mayo faculty and published in JAK with regards to duration of antibiotics um, when you have device infections. So starting on this side, if you have positive blood cultures um, and you do a TEE and you see a valve vegetation, then you just have endocarditis. You just need to treat based on AHA guidelines. However, if you have positive blood cultures, you do a TEE and the vegetation is on the lead, provided that you remove the lead such that your TEE subsequently is negative, you can really just treat those patients with two weeks of antibiotics. You can consider four if you have a resistant um, bacteria that's causing the endocarditis. If it's a lead vegetation with some other complications such as osteomyelitis or abscess, um, they recommend treating with four to six weeks of antibiotics. And when we say um, weeks of antibiotics, this is after starting day one um, is device removal. If you suspect um, blood or generator pocket culture uh, infection, you get your cultures and, and blood cultures are negative, then really you can treat these patients who just have a pocket infection with about 10 days of antibiotics. So management of device infections with regards to antibiotic duration ranges anywhere from seven to 10 days to up to six weeks. Uh, with regards to when to re-implant the device, first and foremost, we should check to see if any of the, if the patient actually needs the device re-implanted. Many of the patients actually end up not needing uh, the device any further. Um, but for patients who do need the device re-implanted, um, you want to get blood cultures and a TEE. And if both are positive, then again, you want to, once you've removed the device, 
you do a TEE. If you have a valve vegetation, you want to treat for endocarditis and reimplant the device only after two weeks of the first negative blood culture. But if it was just a lead vegetation, then again, once you remove that and the patient is no longer having an active source of infection, you can reimplant the device as early as 72 hours after um, repeat blood cultures come back negative. If your blood culture is positive but your TEE is negative, then you just want to repeat the blood cultures till the bacteremia resolves and you can reimplant after 72 hours. If you just have a, a pocket infection, then again, just re make sure your blood cultures are negative for 72 hours before you reimplant the device. So, with regards to device reimplantation, um, the timing is anywhere from 72 hours to two weeks. So with regards to prosthetic heart valves, as of now, our guidelines, our guidelines mainly recommend that if you have a prosthetic heart valve and evidence of relapsing infection, uh, which is defined as the patient gets their full course of antibiotics, they had negative blood cultures, but then shortly after come back with positive cultures again, that's suggestive of a relapsing infection, you should consider surgery for those patients. With regards to devices, if you have a... Um, pacemaker or defibrillator that's infected, then obviously we want to remove the device. Now, if you have endocarditis in a patient who has a device, but the device itself is not infected, um, but it's a resistant bug that's causing the endocarditis, then you may want to consider just removing the device anyway. Likewise, if you have a patient with endocarditis, but the device is not infected, but they're about to undergo valve surgery, then again, you may want to just consider removing the device. So with prosthetic heart valves in the setting of relapsing infection, you want to go for surgery. And for devices, if they're infected, you want to remove. But, or if they're not infected, but it's involving a difficult bug or you're about to undergo valve surgery, you want to consider removing the device. So back to our patient. So this is our patient. Um, pictures taken from his surgery. We're currently looking at his aortic valve, and you can see that his leaflets are completely destroyed from the endocarditis. These are a couple of his leaflets. You can see vegetations here, microperforation, vegetation, calcification. Um, the leaflets were sent for pathology um, and culture. And his blood cultures, like we said, grew back granulocatella, and the same organism grew in his uh, leaflet culture. And this was the ultimate pathological diagnosis, um, saying granulation tissue, calcifications, fibrin deposition, and acute and chronic inflammation compatible with endocarditis. And these are not his histo slides, but I just wanted to show you that um, what you see here, all these you know, little blue dots are bacterial colonies and inflammation in um, the valvular, um, near the valvular apparatus. And you can see that it's pretty avascular. Uh, valves are pretty avascular, which is why you need high doses and sometimes long course of antibiotics to really reach the infection. And you can see that it's, it's pretty friable looking, and this is what enables a lot of these uh, vegetation just to easily, you know, peel off and embolize. So when Dr. Stouffer uh, looked at the patient's valve, the mitral valve actually seemed intact. So what he ended up doing was debriding the abscess and then putting a patch over that area with the hopes that once you fix the aortic valve regurgitation, that's no longer hitting um, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and, and hopefully the patch in and of itself would just take care um, of that location, the patient would not need two valves replaced then. This is a 25 millimeter bovine um, prosthetic valve that was placed at the level of his aortic valve. So the patient's hospital course, day one he presented with those concerning echo findings and hospital admission. By day three he had uh, confirmatory findings of endocarditis on his TEE. He received a temporary pacemaker uh, in the setting of his complete heart block and a left heart cath for pre-op, which was normal. By day four of presentation, he had his aortic valve replaced and his mitral valve repaired. Um, and by day eight, once his blood cultures grew back negative, he had a permanent pacemaker placed. And in less than two weeks of presentation, he was discharged. And on six-week follow-up, he's doing well. So some considerations in him based on what we discussed. He did have risk factors. He's older. He has this leaky valve, which we think was probably some AR prior to presentation. He had a TTE appropriately, and given um, concerning findings on the TTE, he had the TEE, which gave us our definitive diagnosis. He did have a surgical indication. He had two surgical indications, a severe AR and the abscess causing complete heart block. 
surgical timing. Um, so AHA, ACC considers early surgery to be within the hospitalization for endocarditis and before a course of antibiotics is completed. So this patient had his surgery within four days of presentation. The question comes down to should we have given him prophylaxis? Based on our current guidelines, the answer would be no. And it sounds like he got some kind of post-procedure prophylaxis that may have caused him to get C. diff. So um, I would say I would not give him prophylaxis, but it's just something to consider um, and to continue having discussions about. So some takeaway points for us fellows when we're called for a patient with endocarditis, um, we should look for some concerning findings on our ECG, such as heart block, look for abscesses and effusions and new regurgitation on echo. Um, examine our patients, see if they're presenting with heart failure symptoms, because all of these will help direct our management. And if we see a patient in clinic who has significant risk for endocarditis and they're about to go a significant dental procedure, uh, we should consider prophylaxis in this patient, but also remember to tell these patients about good oral hygiene, which I don't think we always think about. Um, and if we're in the hospital and you see a patient with endocarditis and they are either presenting with severe valvular disease, heart failure, have a destructive organism like staph aureus or fungus, or have uncontrolled infection, we should send them for surgery. If they have a high risk vegetation, hypermobile, greater than 10 millimeters, or recurrent embolism, we should strongly consider and discuss surgery. And at least as of now, early surgery we believe is better than delayed surgery, with the exception of a major or hemorrhagic stroke, at which point you may want to delay surgery for about four weeks. If the patient has endocarditis and infection of the leader device, we want to get that removed. If they don't have lead or device infection, but it's a destructive organism like we discussed before, or they're about to undergo valve surgery, consider removal. So in conclusion, the ever-changing spectrum of endocarditis requires a high level of clinical suspicion by the physician, in addition to continued randomized control trials to direct appropriate management. And our current guidelines serve as a useful tool for diagnosing and treating endocarditis and should be used in tandem with the multidisciplinary team approach. And I'll conclude uh, with an introduction by Dr. Osler, who gave a very humbling and impressive and eloquent uh, description of endocarditis, where he says, few diseases present greater difficulties in the way of diagnosis, difficulties which in many cases are practically insurmountable. The protein character of the malady, the latency of the cardiac symptoms, and the close simulation of other disorders combine to render the detection peculiarly difficult. Thank you. Thanks for the great talk, Tina. Um, I just had more of like a comment, I guess. Uh, about two years ago, I was uh, giving a talk to the um, American Association of Oral Surgeons. Uh, it was like a you know a meeting of a scientific meeting for their group, and um, it was about specifically endocarditis. And when I mentioned transcatheter valves, um, a lot of them really weren't aware that that was something we were doing. Um, and so even though they're very uh, vigilant about, you know, giving the correct prophylaxis, they, um, it was su very surprising to me that they were essentially unaware of this. Um, so I was wondering if you came across any information about what our patients are told after getting transcatheter valves and um, if kind of lack of awareness is an issue in the incidence of endocarditis in those patients. I think lack of awareness can be an issue, at least from what I can tell, is the 2017 guideline updates that really emphasize transcatheter devices also um, as uh, potentially requiring uh, endocarditis prophylaxis. So I think we'll see more of that now because the 2017 guidelines, when they were updated, specifically mentioned an increase in, tran in, in giving prophylaxis for transcatheter uh, valves and for patients with um, prosthetic valve uh, material used for both replacement and repair. And I'm not sure if that was as strongly stated earlier. And now if we start seeing more uh, transcatheter uh, placements, especially say for moderate risk AS, we're just gonna see a lot more patients with this. So it's gonna be a problem that we can't avoid or a topic we can't avoid. So I think the awareness will increase. Uh, Tina, that was 
a very good talk. Thank you. Uh, I actually have a couple comments and then a question. One is one other thing I would add to your slide about the sort of the masquerading symptoms that this disease can have. I, I had a young patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He was a young, healthy guy. was a weightlifter. And his only symptom he had was weight loss. He came in, no fevers, nothing. He's just like, Doc, I don't know what's going on. I'm just losing weight like crazy. And obviously we were worried he had a malignancy. But it ended up being, I think, I mean, it was strep or intercocal endocarditis, just sort of subacute. So, I mean, no fevers or nothing, just weight loss. The other thing I've been struck by over the years now is the frequency of perivalvular ring abscesses in bacterial aortic valve endocarditis, even when it doesn't look like they have one on echo. So one comment I would have for the, for the fellows is have a high index of suspicion for, I can't tell how many times the surgeons come back to me afterward and be like, you know, there was a nasty sort of abscess around that, the, the annulus of that valve. And we go back and look at the echo, and the echo looked, I mean, maybe there was a little bit of tiny thickening, but so if you see really anything abnormal around the, the annulus of an aortic valve bacterial endocarditis, assume there's an abscess there. Like I said, I've been struck by how, the, how frequent they are and how sometimes the imaging under, is underwhelming prior to surgery. So my question is, this comes up a lot. You have a patient say with a bicuspid valve who has been receiving prophylaxis for years for their dental procedures, but now by the guidelines would not require it, but they want prophylaxis. What would you recommend to a patient like that who just has a bicuspid valve? They're not, they've never had endocarditis before. They're not immunocompromised, but they are requesting endocarditis prophylaxis for a dental procedure. What, what would you do? What would you say to them? What would you recommend? How would you handle that? I think that's a good question. Um, one, I would see what kind of dental procedure they were going to have. I would be mm. invasive, okay. Um, at least for now, I'm gonna go based on the guidelines, uh, and I probably would not recommend endocarditis in that patient just because our current guidelines don't recommend it based on the, the studies that we have. Um, but if I can. If they really wanted it, though, would you? Just if they really wanted it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah, I guess I would. Uh, which, <laughs> all right. Ask him which one of their relatives is a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I think when we switched over to not giving a lot of prophylaxis, we maybe switched way too far. And, uh, you know, you have to remember that a mitral valve ring repair is still a foreign body, and it's still supposed to have SB prophylaxis. So I think, you know, it just, it just doesn't come to the forefront like it used to. But I think, you know, we, we did go too far, and I think we need to be a lot more aggressive about antibiotic prophylaxis these days. And Although if you're gonna have a, a bug like that that I've never heard of before, I'm not sure what the right prophylaxis is anymore. <laughs> so that was good, Tina. Um, when the guidelines were changed, I'm sure it made a lot of lawyers sad in California. <laughs> because uh, that's been the number one thing on the list as far as litigation uh, in, in Cardiology, anyway. Um, as Stan said, I, if you try to look up whether or not you give antibiotic prophylaxis for those with a mitral ring in, it doesn't say if you have a mitral ring in a repaired mitral valve, you need endocarditis prophylaxis. It says that if there's foreign material used to repair, whatever. Of course, an ASD, so repair an ASD with, with a patch, what do you do about that one? Well, it says... Uh, six months, give it time to endothelialize. So there's some little confusion there. And I remember when, when Dr. Bill Roberts was here, we, we said, Dr. Roberts, do you realize that um, the new guidelines do not recommend endocarditis prophylaxis for individuals with bicuspid aortic valve? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that's correct. So you remember what he said, Robbie? He said, he says, my gosh, I think that's crazy. So uh, we have these patients in the clinic that have been taking endocarditis prophylaxis for mitral valve prolapse for years. 
for bicuspid aortic valves. So when, and their dentist has it ingrained. Of course, nowadays we get some feedback from the dentist, and the dentist will say, well, you don't have to do that anymore. Well, I'm not going to do it. Sometimes you have to argue with the dentist. So uh, in these individuals who've been on it for years, I have a little trouble in stopping it. So don't, you don't have to do that anymore. Because I imagine the scenario when they come down with endocrinitis and you say, well, doc, you tell me to stop the antibody prophylaxis. And here I am about dead having to my, have my valve replaced. So uh, there are a lot of little issues about this. And I've been waiting for these guidelines to come back toward the middle a little bit. It, is that going to happen or not? Because there's been a long, it's been six or seven years, I guess, since those guidelines were changed. Are there any anticipated modifications of those guidelines? Uh, I'm not, not sure. Not that there. you know of? Not that I've seen, but I yeah. just saw the, the 2017 update. So I'm, I, my feeling is that we're going to continue having these updates until eventually we get a new set of That's guidelines. That's right. So, so Robbie, I, I agree with what Robbie said about looking at these echoes and trying to say whether well or not there's a valve ring abscess. Um, so when you have back in the back close to the mitral aortic intervalvular fibrosa, when that's a little thickened, I've been impressed that through the years that the surgeons come back and say, oh, yeah, there was an abscess back there. And then it made me feel like a dummy because I didn't say anything about it. But uh, I think that approach that Robbie mentioned is important also. Okay. It was very good. Thank you. So I think um, one of the things that's important for us is to think about how would we, how would you do evidence, how would you gather evidence that would actually help you to change these guidelines, right? So this is a, a common indication for, or a common, um, what's the right way to say it? It's not uncommon to, to have conditions that previously were prophylaxed, but this is a very uncommon occurrence in that population. So this is not a study that can ever be done on an individual level, right? So I think this is important when we think about how would we, how would we study this, right? The only way you do a randomized control trial in situations like this is to use some emerging techniques of sort of large-scale cluster randomization and other kinds of things within big health systems. It's the kind of thing, though, that that I think is, I raise it only because I think it's important for us to be aware of the need to do these kinds of studies at health system levels. Um, they're hard to do. We now have data sources that make it more doable because this is an outcome that's actually pretty easily detectable within health records. Um, but this is not, when we say um, what we need is a randomized control trial, in a lot of cases that means we could potentially just randomize people. In this case, we probably can't just randomize people. What we'd have to do is have buy-in at a very large level um, where you randomize sites or health systems or, or different kinds of things, and you look at, at very big picture outcomes. Um, so it requires a, um, a, a, a big scale effort to be able to, do, to, to look at these kinds of things um, that have very rare outcomes. So it's, it's hard to do. I think it's probably doable, but it's, it's not simple. You, the registry won't do it. So what you need is you, you have, a, so, so essentially what you need is you need to randomize within, ex, within um, populations where the data are already collected. Well, let's say at Emory and, and three or four other health systems, you randomize by clinic. So you have standard practices um, and all the data are already being collected. So in a sense, what we're getting to is the point where the registry is already present. But if you don't do some method of, of random assignment, it's going to be really hard to know. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.